Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. Um, first of all, a couple of announcements. It is December, it's holiday time, and it's time to order holiday gifts from Wellness Forum Health. And we send out some fabulous things from the kitchen, including healthy cookies and Dell's famous gingerbread biscotti, which smells up the whole building like gingerbread for an entire month. And I have to use all of the willpower in my whole system to not be constantly walking over to the kitchen to eat gingerbread because I love it and we only get it one time a year at, at holiday time. But anyway, that gift certificates, signed and autographed books we have all, and gift baskets, which we ship all over the world. So now's the time to call us and order those things. Second thing, Dr. Kathy Waller's amazing vaccine course um, is available uh, now. We've started filming the lectures and we're going to continue to film lectures for the next four or five months. This is a huge um, collection of information all in one place. Everything you want to know about these vaccines that um, that you've had to look here and there and everywhere to find all in one place and um, we have a pre we have an early registration offer for that. And then winter semester we're offering again the diet and lifestyle intervention course and several other classes and we have a package deal for the vaccine course and diet and lifestyle so if you're interested in any of those things I just mentioned uh, please send me an email at Pam Popper at msn.com also if you're thinking about careers in the fields like what we do here at Wellness Farm Health send me an email this would be a good time to chat as we're getting ready for figuring out what we're all going to do in 2016 um, what I'm going to do in 2016 by the way is the same thing I'm doing in 2015 love it just going to do more of it all right, so let's talk about a couple of important topics today. Um, the number of routine tests that are recommended to most people continues to grow all the time. Uh, the philosophy today is if we can test for it, we absolutely should, and more testing is always better than less testing. More everything in the medical field is always better than less is the way that the whole thing goes. But the reason why consumers agree to all of these tests is because theoretically it's supposed to reduce the risk of comorbidity and or death. Um, reducing the risk of death is particularly compelling in the case of cancer screenings because people are terrified of a diagnosis of cancer. Well, I want to talk about thyroid cancer. It used to be rare and incidents started increasing about 10 years ago and there were two reasons for it. One is that improved imaging has detected thyroid cancer. A lot of times we find it while looking for something else. So an image of the upper body to find the source of pain or sometimes some other symptom that might be going on um, appears to show, happens to show an abnormality in the thyroid. Um, but um, most of these cancers that when a cancer is using air quotes would be better off uh, left undetected detected. Um, but the detection of what we call incidental lomas was um, not unnoticed by enterprising medical professionals and others who profit from uh, disease mongering. They have successfully, successfully promoted the idea to the public that everybody's at risk of developing thyroid cancer and should regularly get tested for it. And the campaign's been really successful, resulting in hundreds of thousands of people being screened every year for thyroid cancer and a rapidly increasing uh, number of diagnoses. The problem is that the death rate from thyroid cancer hasn't dropped in spite of all this early detection and early treatment that's supposed to reduce the incidence of death. Researchers at the Mayo Clinic looked at data on 566 men and women who were diagnosed with thyroid cancer between 1935 and 2012. The number of new cases of thyroid cancer doubled from 7.1 per 100,000 people between 1990 and 1999 and almost doubled again to 13.1 per 100,000 between 2000 and 2012. The number of patients who had symptoms leading to a diagnosis stayed the same while the number of people who were asymptomatic when diagnosed with thyroid cancer quadrupled. But the most important statistic is that when the incidence of death from thyroid cancer was calculated, it hadn't changed since 1935. So what we had was more diagnoses, more treatment, no difference in the death rate. In many cases, thyroid cancer was diagnosed after a tumor was accidentally discovered during imaging tests for something else, and 27% were diagnosed after the discovery of nodules that led doctors to order further imaging of the neck. Now, I have already posted in the Health Brace Library another article on thyroid nodules, which I think is worth reading if this pertains to you, because most of those thyroid nodules should be left alone, yet they're being treated as if they were cancer. Overdiagnosis has made thyroid cancer the fastest growing cancer diagnosis in the United States today. 
Now, the lead researcher in the Mayo study stated that the treatment of these indolent cancers represents overtreatment and it's harmful because removing some or all of the thyroid gland can damage a patient's vocal cords or result in calcium deficiencies for the rest of the person's lives. He also stated that patients are harmed financially. Cancer treatment, even if it's unnecessary, is really expensive. The cost for surgeries for thyroid cancer was $1.6 billion in 2013 alone. Now, copays and deductibles are a direct cost for the people who are affected, while subsidized care is an indirect cost that all of us are sharing in many ways. The researchers say we should stop using the term cancer to describe most of the abnormalities discovered from screening, which might result in fewer treatments. He suggests that a term such as papillary lesions of indolent course would, would uh, carry less of emotional charge. I don't think anybody knows what that means, so it'd be hard to be emotionally charged about it, but this is another example of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, which is such a common practice in medical care. Instead of renaming a condition that patients are, no, are better off not knowing about, why don't we just stop doing the testing and, and uh, the useless screening and, and uh, treatment of indolent cancers? Why don't we just stop all that? That would make much more sense to me. But of course, what makes sense in medicine? Often not uh, driving decisions in medicine, as we all know. All right, something else I want to talk about. Are you sick? Are you depressed? Are you both? Does one lead to the other? You know, interesting thing to talk about. Okay, so one of the major tenets of what we do here at Wellness Forum Health is to find the cause of whatever's wrong and address the cause or cause is. Often an individual's diet and lifestyle are responsible for what's going on, at least in part for the conditions that they've been diagnosed with. And in many cases, improving diet and lifestyle habits addresses the underlying cause, which then starts to resolve all of the issues that the patient complains about and of course that's not done the typical thing that's done is people go from doctor to doctor everybody's got a body part or an organ system that they work on and treat and prescribe drugs for and etc so let's take an example inflammation is part of the immune system's response to illness and infection when people are sick production of inflammatory cytokines increases these cytokines not only promote the healing functions of the body, but also affect a person's brain and behavior, resulting in increased sleep, decreased appetite, and decreased sexual drive. This is nature's way of encouraging people to rest so that they can recover faster. Illness and infection are not the only cause of increased inflammatory cytokine levels, however. Fat cells produce cytokines, contributing to higher inflammation levels, and higher inflammation levels are a factor in the development of diseases too. This is one of the reasons why overweight people have so much higher risk of so many conditions. They generally have higher levels of systemic inflammation. Now, how do people become overweight or obese? Well, we're back to those diet and lifestyle habits. Now, here's where things get interesting. The psychiatric profession has clear guidelines for diagnosing depression, but diagnosis remains subjective. Furthermore, in many cases, patients just report that they're depressed. They're sleeping more, they're tired, they have no appetite, decreased interest in sex, and in response, family practice docs and internists often prescribe antidepressant drugs. In many cases, the patients aren't depressed, but they're sick or they're suffering from high inflammation levels and the response to these conditions mimics symptoms of depression. Now many studies, and I want to give you some evidence that backs this up, many studies have shown that psychiatric patients have high levels of inflammatory cytokines and in indicating poor underlying physical health. There is other evidence that illness may play a role in depression. Pro-inflammatory cytokine drugs like interferon A cause side effects including depression, cognitive impairment, and suicidal ideation. And several studies have shown that patients who do not respond to antidepressants improve when given anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen. So the depressed patient may be sick and the sick person may be depressed. The traditional approach to this issue is for a psychiatrist to prescribe antidepressants and uh, for the depression and for one or more other doctors to prescribe drugs to treat the other physical illnesses causing inflammation like type 2 diabetes and chronic infections, leaving the underlying issues, which are diet and lifestyle and the weight gain that may have accompanied those uh, diet and lifestyle habits, completely unaddressed. 
One thing I want to mention here is that this certainly isn't uh, documentation that the psychiatry profession's uh, stance that um, um, that uh, depression is you know a physical condition, meaning the uh, chemical deficiencies or imbalances in the brain is correct. It's not correct. What what I'm basically saying here is that physical illness makes people feel terrible. It makes them feel like sleeping. It makes them feel like inter you know losing interest in other activities, and that's those are some of the hallmarks of depression. Fix the physical illness and the, and the uh, depressive symptoms will go away. So that leads me to the better option is to address the cause with diet and lifestyle change, which, which can result in weight loss, lower inflammation levels, and improvement or reversal of underlying conditions like diabetes and chronic infections. This in turn reduces, reduces the incidence or symptoms or resolves the depression as well. Um, the approach is simple, it's inexpensive. What's the drawback? Well, it's not patentable, you can't put it in a pill, so it'll never gain traction with the medical profession, but hopefully it'll gain traction or continue to gain traction with consumers who are sick and tired of being medicated and treated like perpetual sick patients in a system that doesn't help anybody get healthy. All right, that's all for now. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.